Uh, if you are a logical and analytical thinker, uh, this moment is for you. If you're not, uh, just think about the potluck for a minute. <laughs> but you'll be able to appreciate the analysis of a Bible scholar named Merrill Tenney, who made this observation about chapter 20 in the Gospel of John. He said, were there no resurrection, faith in God would be irrational, the concept of a moral universe impossible, and stark pessimism the necessary philosophy of all humanity. So if the resurrection were not real, that Jesus not only died for our sins, but also proved that a spirit-filled human being can rise from the dead, our faith would be futile and not true. All the empirical evidence points to the metaphysical resurrection of Jesus. Believing in Jesus is the most reasonable response to the data. Apparently, the Apostle John is a bit of a scientist because when he finally crawled into the empty tomb after Peter, he saw and believed. Uh, so that's it for you analytical thinkers. Uh, if you like forensics, so if you like NCIS, you don't have to raise your hand. Uh, the Aurora Tea Garden Mysteries, if you're a Hallmark person, or um, Murder, She Wrote, if you like forensics, you'll appreciate today's text, uh, because in it, we find ourselves in the, about a third of the way through the first century, we are in a garden of graves outside Jerusalem. One grave being a tomb in which the body of Jesus of Nazareth has just been placed on a Friday afternoon. And now, early Sunday morning, the stone is rolled away and the tomb is empty. And a woman named Mary Magdalene is there to see it. But before we let the Apostle John tell us the story, a brief look at the character of Mary Magdalene. She was from, did you know this, a place called Magdala, which was a town near Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee. She had, according to Luke chapter 8, verse 2, seven demons cast out of her. This woman had had a difficult life. Along with other women, she followed Jesus throughout Israel during his earthly ministry, according to Luke chapter 8, helping to support and care for him. One of her friends was Mary, the mother of Jesus, according to John 19, and another of her friends was Mary, the mother of James and John, according to Mark 15. Notably, she did not abandon Jesus during his worst trials, but stayed close during his crucifixion, according to John 19, and his burial, according to Matthew 27. She was a faithful woman. She had returned, according to Mark chapter 16, to the tomb very early Sunday morning. And here we segue to today's text. In John 20, she'd gone with two other women to place additional burial spices on Jesus' body. And seeing an angel, they all fled, but according to John 20, Mary returned. So here is today's true gospel story. I'll read for us from John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary of Magdala went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. 
So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, her mother tongue, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary of Magdala went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. What do you think about this woman? Man, she had pluck. She had been through a lot, and she had pluck. The disciples are hunkered down at home. And she's up at O dark 30 to go to a graveyard by herself. Who would do that here in the room? She goes to the tomb. She runs to report to Peter and John that the stone was rolled away. She talks to not one, but two angels who we know are really scary to encounter. She tells them bold and straight what she's concerned about. She talks to a guy she doesn't even recognize, and she offers to go and retrieve an adult male body. Her beloved deliverer has died. The one who, perhaps, speculating the first male she'd ever met who saw her for who she was and treated her like she mattered. I don't know. She's not afraid to go to a graveyard when it's dark. She's not afraid to talk to angels. She wants to make sure that the body of her beloved Savior gets treated with the dignity that it deserves. The disciples, on the other hand, are taking a little different approach to the morning. Uh, a little background on them, on Peter and John uh, in particular. They were commercial fishing partners, along with John's brother named James. And they were called as a threesome, according to Luke chapter 5, to follow Jesus. He got a threefer when he went and called them from fishing to follow him. And according to Mark chapter 5, these three, Peter and James and John, were allowed to witness at least one healing that Jesus did that the other disciples weren't allowed to see. The healing of Jairus' daughter. We're not sure why, but they just got to be on the inside. We know that Peter and John got to go with Jesus out in the hills. 
where they had a supernatural encounter with the spirits of Moses and Elijah. Isn't that weird? But they were the only disciples, along with James, John's brother, that were allowed to witness that. And we also know that Peter and John were invited by Jesus to pray in Gethsemane the night before he was executed. They were arguably Jesus' inner circle of friends, Peter, James, and John. So for Mary to run to them when she discovered that the tomb was empty makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? If they were like the closest friends of Jesus, she would go to them to say, hey, this is what I just saw. But let's give these guys a little bit of grace for laying low at home when Mary was at the cemetery in the wee hours of the morning, um, these guys were probably exhausted. I mean, imagine what they'd been through in the last 48 hours. Wouldn't you be exhausted? Just mentally, em physically, emotionally? Uh, they were probably exhausted. Uh, at least some of them had to be embarrassed for not being very manly and turning tail and running as soon as some official opposition came to Jesus. They ran away deserted their friend, I think I would be a bit embarrassed and ashamed of myself if I was them at that moment, having to kind of think that, process that thing through. Maybe they were actually having a cup of tea together and talking in the early morning hours and just encouraging one another in the Lord and maybe even praying for one another. So the scriptures don't tell us whether they were trying to distract themselves or whether they were actually being very spiritual and just trying to get their head together and figure out what next. We don't know what they were doing. We know that they did run for the tomb. Peter and John ran for the tomb, like at a dead run, when Mary told them about the stone being moved. And they did look around a bit. You might say that they were using their faculties to gather forensic information so that they could decide what to do, that they concluded that there was nothing more for them at the tomb in that moment, and so they went back home. I conclude that even though Peter and John and Mary were responding differently to Jesus' apparent departure, that they were just people trying to make sense of a situation that they would not have chosen. How many of us have to make sense of situations we would not have chosen? And they were just trying to figure it out and make sense of life and what they were supposed to do next. Mary was inquisitive and bold and she grieved openly. Uh, Peter and John were, as I've mentioned, were not really sure how they were feeling because the scripture doesn't tell us although they kind of seem satisfied to be guys and assess the physical situation and go back home to keep doing whatever they were doing. Um, I'd like to make several observations about this true story. And the first is that Jesus uh, met Mary where she was at. Uh, Mary was bold and she put herself out there. And Jesus met her. He showed himself to her. He trusted her with delivering the news of the resurrection to the other disciples. If she had stayed at home grieving, that wouldn't have happened. Some might have argued that that was foolish for her to go by herself in the dark to a cemetery. Some might have argued that was inappropriate for a woman to go be that bold. If Mary had not done that, everything that happened wouldn't have happened. And uh, I think there's a principle here for us, men and women. When we're inquisitive, Jesus is responsive. When we're inquisitive, Jesus is responsive. When we seek him, we'll find him. Does that sound familiar? God told Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 4, when you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. That was his message for his people. The prophet Jeremiah 
speaking for the Lord, also said in Jeremiah 29, 13, when you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Does that sound familiar? And if that isn't good enough that we have this biblical principle that when we seek, the Lord will find him. He's not trying to be elusive. When we seek, the Lord will find him. But when we do that, he gives us something truly worthwhile to do. Like Mary, he'll empower us to be messengers of good news. I think this is more than just a passing observation to make about Mary. We know from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, some of you have this memorized. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he created in advance. He prepared in advance for us to do. So we know that the Lord actually has made a plan for what he's going to do with not only the likes of us corporately, for, for us individually. The Lord has plans for us. Mary stepped up, and Jesus gave her something to do right now. And she got to go be a bearer of good news. And I will contend that that's a, a spiritual and biblical principle, that when we step up and we inquire of the Lord, when we lean into relationship with the Lord, he'll meet us but he'll also give us something useful and good to do that brings good news to other people. It takes a whole lot of different forms, but he'll give us something good to do. And he's, he's already got them planned. Secondly, Jesus met Peter and John where they were at. They were in a different place than Mary, but Jesus met them where they were at too. Were they bold that morning? Not really. Did they put their feelings out there? Uh, we're not sure. Did they have a supernatural encounter at the tomb? No, they really didn't. Were they a little bit slow? Uh, maybe they were a little bit slow. But when his disciples are a little slow, Jesus is a lot patient. Take that to the bank. Uh, that's my personal testimony at the very least. That when a, a disciple of Jesus is a little bit slow, Jesus is a lot patient. Hallelujah. I could stop right there, but I'm not going to. Why did Jesus, excuse me, what did Jesus tell Mary to tell the disciples when she said, Mary, go and tell my disciples? She said, Go to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. He did not tell Mary, Mary, go tell those knuckleheads that they should have manned up and come to the tomb before you did. Tell those weaklings to get out from behind locked doors and get on with the business of carrying out my work. Jesus didn't do that. He said, no, go tell my brothers. Isn't that awesome? Did he call them servants? No, in that moment. Did he call them friends? No, in that moment. He called them my brothers. Go tell my brothers this good news. Jesus' followers have gone Wrap your brains and your hearts around this. From being called servants in John chapter 12 to friends in John chapter 15 to brothers in John chapter 20. Are we servants of Jesus? Yes, that's still true. Are we his friends? Yes, that's still true. Are we brothers? Does Jesus look at us as family and beloved brothers? Yes, he does. And sisters. Wow. Jesus makes it explicit that his disciples have a relationship with him. That's something besides condescending and remember your place. 
That's not something to do when you're trying to shame somebody. If Jesus was trying to shame his disciples for messing up, he would have given them another message than, Mary, go tell my brothers that, hey, my God is their God. Yeah. Hmm. Because Jesus wasn't trying to shame them. He was meeting them where they were at. Which is grown-ups trying to figure out life and not quite sure what to do next. Wow. A third thing. In verse 16, Jesus simply calls Mary's name. Mary. He calls Mary's name, and she instantly knew it was him. Just the way he said it. He went from gardener to Jesus with one word, Mary. She recognized his voice. And I'd like to point out that Jesus has written your name in his book of life. If you have trusted Jesus, he not only knows your name, He's written your name in the book of life. Don't take my word for it. Check out Philippians 4.3 and Revelations 3.5. He has written your name in the book of life. And this is really cool. According to Revelation 2.17, he's got a secret new name for you. I think sometimes about what that name's going to be. Remember back in the 70s, they had those plaques and decoupaged plaques, you know, and they'd, they'd have your names on them, and then they'd just say what that name means, and then you'd hang it on your wall, and you'd try to live into it. And, oh, mine said, uh, Mark means courageous, and that always made me kind of have my chest kind of puff out a little bit, you know, and go, yeah, that's right. That's not what they called me in second grade, but yeah, I'll take Mark's courageous, but um, yeah. God, Jesus, is going to give me a secret new name. Check it out, seriously, Revelations 2.17. If you're bored, do it right now. We were known by God by name before we were even conceived. And our parents decided what to name us. Jesus knew our name. And we will be known, if we want to be known, by Jesus forever. Wow. Wow. I love that. Um, You know, in my life, I'll go out a a little bit on a limb here to share with you. uh, The closest thing to hearing Jesus call my name uh, was on a walk on the beach at Fort Stevens State Park uh, in the early 80s when I was really struggling with uh, who I was and just felt like I was never enough, you know, to be mark or to be spiritual and a Christian and I just didn't feel very manly and my friends were getting married and I wasn't and I, I was just really struggling and I had a very strong verbal impression. I know Baptists aren't supposed to get these but I had a very strong verbal impression and the words were Mark you don't have to be anybody else but the man I made you to be. That was my word from the Lord when he spoke my name, Mark. You don't have to be anything else but the man I made you to be. Not trying to make a point about anything, just to let you know that uh, the Lord knows my name. And uh, the Lord knows your name. And he's got a good word of encouragement for you and for your destiny. I don't know it, but he does. Fourth thing, Uh, Jesus sometimes allows us to feel like he's absent or distant. Don't you hate this? Jesus sometimes allows you to feel like he's distant or even absent from the universe. I wish it wasn't true, but it is. Apparently, he can work through those times to forge our faith. And this seems to jibe with what Jesus taught his disciples. For example, Luke 18, verse 8. But I will contend and say the Bible backs me up that when Jesus feels absent, it's always and only an apparent absence. 
He's never truly absent. He just, he just can feel absent sometimes. Remember Jesus promised his disciples in John 14, 18, I will not leave you as orphans. That's a promise. That's the word of the Lord to his people. I will not leave you as orphans. And Jesus Christ is, is the same yesterday, today, and amen. Jesus was physically absent for his, from his disciples for a bit, even as he's physically absent from us today. But Jesus promised that his spirit would remain with his disciples and with us always and forever. In John 14, verse 16, he said, I will ask the Father, Jesus speaking here to his disciples, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. God's Spirit is... It's not even true to say he's, the Spirit is never far from us. It's like the Spirit is never absent from us. He is here with us forever. And may I encourage you by mentioning that Jesus always redeems droopy microphones. That Jesus always redeems the times that he feels distant from us. I'm going to say that again. Jesus always redeems the times that he feels distant from us. He does something good with it. God works the night shift. When things are dark in your life, God's busy because God works the night shift. He worked in Mary's life. He worked in Peter and John's life. He works in our lives. Jesus is very thrifty. He never wastes anything. I like that. He causes all things to work together for good, to build you up, to call you out, and to lead you on. He uses all things to work together. It sometimes feels like Jesus is absent, but he is not absent, he is not idle, and he is not far away. And fifthly, and finally, we can, like John, believe before we get everything all figured out. The disciples had been with Jesus about how long? About three years. Peter and John had been especially close to him. Do they have everything all figured out? No, they don't have everything all figured out. It wasn't until John saw the abandoned grave clothes in verse 8, right here in John chapter 20, that it says that he, he believed. But even then, according to verse 9, Peter and John still didn't understand that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They still didn't have it all figured out. But did, John, did, that, did that keep John from believing, not having everything all figured out? No. John still believed. We are tied into the uh, police band or something here today, I think. Yeah. Ah, is that it? Yeah. Mm. Is, that, is, that, is that what you're getting on your phones? It's a missing child alert? Yeah. Can I pray for that? Yeah. Or can, I'd like somebody else to pray for that. Ted, you got a heart for kids. Would you come pray for... Can we get the pulpit mic on here again, please? What's the name? Anyone have a name? No? Okay. Okay. Father, we are thankful that um, this uh, little interruption is not an interruption in your plan. It's uh, part of your plan. And so, Lord, this morning we just uh, we want to turn over to you this situation with this missing child. And, Lord, we want to um, just trust that you're at work there. Lord, we do pray that you would be um, helping to identify what's happened to him or her and that that they would be brought home safely. We just yeah. uh, pray that whatever it takes and uh, whether this alert can be used for that purpose, 
We just trust you with that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ted. I'm not sure where you're at today uh, when it comes to faith in the Lord. Uh, if this is all totally foreign to you, like if this is like new to you, I would just invite you this morning to continue exploring who the Bible says Jesus is and what he taught and what he says real life is about. Uh, if you understand, if you're in that place today of actually understanding, at least generally, who the Bible says Jesus is and what he taught and how he says we have full life, which is by trusting and following him, I would urge you today to do what John did. And even though you don't have it all figured out, believe in Jesus. Trust him and follow Jesus, even though you don't have all your questions answered. And this morning, if you are a dyed-in-the-wool believer, I strongly urge you to pray today and ask God to cause your life to help other people believe in him. In summary, uh, I'll say that Jesus' apparent departure left his disciples to have to work through some stuff. They processed differently, but Jesus met each one where they were at with grace. Jesus, and if you're sleeping, wake up. This is it in eight words. Uh, Jesus meets us where we are at with grace. Will you trust him this morning? You are welcome to the Lord's table. I would encourage you to take it. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for hearing our prayer for this child who is missing. We trust that you heard that and that you are answering it. Thank you for John chapter 20 and for letting us see what was going on with Mary Magdalene and with Peter and John and, and Jesus just to see how your response to them was, uh, was gracious and uh, not punitive or shaming. But you met Mary and Peter and John where they were at and you told them what to do next. So Lord, I just pray that we as individuals and that we as a congregation would follow you, Jesus, to where you want to take us next. And we pray in your name. Amen. Brother Roy.